do this sign now, haven't I? Maybe not, Julian. Oh, okay. um, I shan't then. <laughs> the theme of today's show is the past, the future and the present. With regards to the past, well, Julian, something very special happened 35 years ago on the 16th of May. And what was that? Well, for some reason, the then Master of the Rolls, Lord Denning, decided that he would sign my practicing certificate. And I became a solicitor of the Supreme Court. And in fact, this is the practicing certificate in question. A real live Lord Denning practicing certificate. So, to show everybody what one looks like, and that's Lord Denning's signature. There it is. Now, Julian, you must have witnessed a number of major changes in the law in this country in the past 35 years. Can you tell the viewers what major changes are particularly significant? When I started, the law was a profession. It wasn't a business. You ran the, your legal practice effectively as gentlemen did, an old-fashioned view perhaps. You undertook conveyancing and probate. You undertook wills, you undertook various civil litigation and a certain small amount of criminal litigation work. That was the jam on top of the bread and butter which normal legal work provided. Now of course it's become a business. The Legal Services Commission, the SRA, the Legal Ombudsman's Office and the Law Society control us all so much that you can hardly breathe without someone looking over your shoulder. Every controversial truly. Of course. And um, we've seen how fit for purpose the SRA is at present because they can't even get their basic administration right. And these are the people who are supervising us. And this is a vast change. But within the actual areas of law I've practiced, primarily criminal law, there have been major changes as well. The right of silence without comment has gone. In other words, inferences can be drawn from silence. If you don't give evidence in, at a trial, you, you lose certain protections, which is that effectively no comment could be made. You have to tell the prosecution not only what your defence is, but sometimes what errors they've made in the preparation of their case. In other words, the defence lawyers have to help the prosecution to convict the client. And this is all contrary to the principles with which I was brought up, which I was taught, admittedly starting 40 years ago. So, Julian, you've mentioned some laws that you don't approve of, but have there been any laws introduced that you feel have benefited this country? Numerous laws, far too many of them in the last 10-15 years or so, I hasten to add. But probably the most important is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, because that meant that somebody who had been taken into custody by the police had the right to have a solicitor, either the duty solicitor or their own solicitor, present to redress the balance between the accused person, who settled psychologically at a low ebb in a police station, and of course the police themselves. You redress the balance by having a lawyer present. That was a major change, one which I envisaged in about 1979 when I set up the informal duty solicitor scheme in Stevenage, when I then practiced, and now which is entrenched and indeed treated as a precedent for virtually the whole of the westernised world. Yes, Julie and I went to Hong Kong last month and in Hong Kong, although there's a duty lawyer scheme at court, there isn't one at the police station. So, Julian, I think that might be a change that the Hong Kong legal system could adapt. Well, I think uh, we've already seen in the European Court, in a case involving the state of Turkey, and subsequently in the Supreme Court here, in a case involving the, the Her Majesty's Advocates in Scotland, that they're accepting that the right to have a lawyer present from the time of arrest onwards within the accusatorial system is one of the fundamental human rights. Let us hope that governments don't decide to save five pence by not paying properly, ending up paying fifty pounds to put right to the errors that can undoubtedly will result. Now, turning from changes uh, in the big system in the past to looking forward, specifically with regards to Hong Kong. In 1997, the British rule in Hong Kong came to an end. Under the basic law, the capitalist system and the Hong Kong way of life were to be preserved for the forthcoming 50 years. Julian and I interviewed the one-time governor of Hong Kong, Sir David Akers James, for his view on what the remaining 40 years in Hong Kong is likely to be. <laughs> This is um, an interview of Sir David Akers-Jones, former administ senior administrator 
in Hong Kong. So David, thank you very much for speaking to Judy and myself. We are the lawyers with attitude. D do you feel that you are more Chinese than English or have you retained your English character over all the years in, in Hong Kong? I think I've retained my English character, yeah, yeah. All the essentials of my English character. And how do you see Hong Kong in, let us say, 40 years' time? 40 years from now. 40 years from now, with, when the People's Republic of China will finally take over, or so they claim they well, will take over. Well, you're asking me to, to say what will China be like in 40 years' time, because the um, agreement with China concludes 50 years after 1997. So, um, uh, at the rate that China is changing now, uh, I would expect that China will have uh, some sort of elected government by, uh, by then, uh, at the rate that is changing now. Uh, but it will have, the elected government will uh, it won't be the different, uh, it won't be the same sort of elected government that um, we're used to in Little England uh, because uh, the elected government of China will have to have a form of elections for 1.3 billion people. Uh, so obviously that form of, uh, of government uh, will be very different from from the sort of government we're used to for Little England, as I say. How do you see the questions, for example, in the for immediately foreseeable future of commerce between Hong Kong and the People's Republic of China? I think the barriers, any barriers that ex exist would have been removed uh, long before 40 years from now. Do you see that happening at present? Are the barriers gradually being removed? They are gradually being removed, yes. And does that mean that... Not gradually, they're being quickly removed, actually. Does that also mean, perhaps, that ideas from Hong Kong, uh, the democracy, or the idea of democracy, from, as you called it, Little England, would that permeate well, I'm, through... I'm using the word little, uh, comparing our sort of 50 to 60 million people with 1.3 billion people. Uh, that's why I use the word little. Uh, it's little by comparison uh, with, um, with England and Britain. Uh, but gradually the barriers to trade and, and business investment and so on are all changing in Hong Kong. But um, don't forget that we have a common law system in Hong Kong and that is still being maintained. Uh, we have our own currency, but uh, gradually uh, I imagine that the, the yen, the RMB, will be become more used in Hong Kong as time goes on. After all, uh, we're linked to the American dollar at the moment, but um, how long we will be linked, it's difficult to say, but maybe 10 years from now we won't be linked. So David, you've also been involved, of course, in, in work within the community. Uh, I understand, I think you're on the committee of the Hong Kong Football Club. Yeah, I'm, I'm vice patron. I'm not on, no longer on the committee. No longer on the committee. No, no. Are you looking forward to the visits of a certain London football team later this year? Yes, I am. Yeah. I, dare I ask? And you can. You need to answer this question. I get a ticket. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, Sir David. They, they will let you have a ticket. Dare I ask which football team you support? I've heard that it might be Arsenal. But I'm not sure. Well, indeed, it is Arsenal because mm -hmm. Judy and I are both Arsenal season ticket holders, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, have seen the program, which has indicated that in July in their pre-season yeah. pre for next season, mm. they are due to, to come here. Well, I sincerely hope you'll, you'll see that. See. Well, maybe I'll see you there too. <sighs> well, that would yeah. be very nice. Mm. So David, you're currently president of the Business and Professionals Federation of Hong Kong. 
Could you explain the role of that organisation? Well, uh, after the agreement with Britain, the joint declaration between Britain and Belgium, uh, with uh, mainland China, with China, the Chinese government, about the future of Hong Kong, uh, known as the Joint Declaration about the Future of Hong Kong, uh, which was in uh, 1984 uh, 85, the final uh, signing off was done in the House, by the House of Commons, part of the British Parliament signed up on the joint agreement. <coughs> and then Hong Kong, uh, representatives of Hong Kong, representatives of the Central People's Government had to sit down and turn the joint agreement into a basic law for, for Hong Kong, the Special Administrative Region, which would embody in terms of the joint declaration. And well, as, lawyer, as lawyers, I think you'd be interested to um, and reassured to know that the, the legal system is, is flourishing in Hong Kong. And I think that uh, our management systems are also flourishing in Hong Kong. And there are about um, several, several thousand of our accountants are working uh, every day in, in the mainland, uh, our accountant firms, KPMG, Deloitte, and so on, uh, the majority of their staff, <coughs> of their total staff, are now in, in the mainland. Uh, and our systems of management, control of business, and so on, are spreading into China. Our architects do a tremendous amount of work in China, and uh, our lawyers also are contributing to the development of the legal system in China. Just uh, on the point you mentioned that um, the common law system is influencing Ch the Chinese legal system, have you any examples of that? Well, our, our lawyers appear in, 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 in business cases in China. Uh, and, uh, this is going on every day. Our lawyers are there. Uh, uh, but of course we have our own arbitration system in Hong Kong, uh, so the business cases involving relations with the mainland uh, can be arbitrated in Hong Kong. So, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable, I think, how the two, two systems really are working together and developing and getting closer and the differences being, are gradually being ironed out. China perhaps moving to a more uh, open, open-minded approach to civil legal so process. Civil society is developing. That's right. So David, okay. once again, thank you very much for the time you've given to us today. <laughs> and I wish you all the very best. <laughs> and enjoy the football. Mm -hmm. I, I, I assume you'll be able to find a ticket. I'm sure with your influence you'll find someone who will oh. give you a ticket. Oh. Oh. On a previous occasion, Julian mentioned that his admission certificate as a solicitor was signed by the redoubtable Lord Denning. Now, Julian, that wasn't the only occasion that you met Lord Denning, was it? No, I met him in 1971 when I was an undergraduate. First year of my degree, my cousin, who was then on the Law Society Council, I think it was much more formal in those days, invited me to a solicitor's journal function. I went along in my one and only suit, looking suitably out of place, with the great and the good, ended up in the corner of the room, big hall in fact, with an elderly man with a charming accent who asked me my views on the future of the legal profession. I said, being only about 18, 19 years of age, well, sir, I think that in my lifetime, but not my professional lifetime, solicitors will have the same rights of audience as barristers. Within a few moments of starting the conversation, my cousin came, bowed deeply and said, Master, may I formally introduce you to Julian Young? And I realised with horror 
I think the look of horror must have crossed my face that I had been wittering on to the greatest legal mind of the 20th century, Lord Denning. He just turned round and he said very politely, Well, Mr. Kisson, Mr. Young and I have been having a fascinating conversation on the future of the legal profession. Whereupon he ignored my cousin, who after all was in a position of some authority on the Law Society Council, and continued his conversation with me, not putting me down, bearing in mind there was a 70-something year gap, 60-something year gap between us, but taking into account all that I'd said, and I wonder what he must have thought. Of course, I was partly right and partly wrong. Yes, solicitors have got high rights of audience, and indeed I hold those high rights in criminal cases. And it was within my professional lifetime as well as within my lifetime itself. So maybe, just for once, just as Lord Denning saw the future from his lofty position, from my then lowly position as an undergraduate, I also saw the future. Thank you, Julian, for that lovely anecdote. And it's true. <laughs> I would expect nothing less of you, Julian. Oh, you are, after all, an oh. officer of the court. Of the old Supreme Court. Nobody's too sure, actually, whether we're still officers of the new Supreme Court, in view of their distance from the original system. But, I don't know, maybe we still are, maybe we still aren't. But we're trusted by the courts. And that's the main thing. <laughs>
I suspect he's paid a political price for such insensitivity. Nevertheless, we can't stop people telling jokes. Otherwise, I'm afraid to say, since most jokes are based upon some, something unfortunate about someone, uh, there won't be very much humour in the world, especially on the stand-up circuit, which both you and I know fairly well. <laughs> yes, we have in the past um, done stints as stand-up comedians, but we'll talk about that another time. Julian, turning to more serious issues, apparently the government has urged judges to strengthen sentences on the owners of out-of-control dogs. What do you think about that as a dog lover yourself? Well, will this law come to bite the government on the backside or not? I don't know. There are far more important issues, I'm afraid, than dangerous dogs. And dangerous dogs are a problem, but they're not such a great problem as perhaps matters of principle that should be addressed. Antisocial behaviour orders, which are out of control, can't be policed and seem to be issued by courts too readily. The peculiar laws in relation to the possession of firearms which means that you can be guilty of the offence of possession of a firearm and serve a minimum of five years imprisonment, even if you didn't know that what you had in your possession was a firearm. That's against all the principles that I understand of criminal law, and perhaps that is something, since it is a matter of complete and utter principle, that should be addressed by this government before we worry about dangerous dogs. There are enough, there's enough legislation dealing with animals that are out of control and criminal offences which people commit by having animals out of control, especially dogs. Let's deal with principles first and worry about the individual relatively minor offences. I say relatively because dogs can kill, unfortunately. Let's deal with the relatively minor matters after we've dealt with the matters of principle. Now, finally, it's that time of the week again. Yes, it's joke of the week. Joke of the week. Right. Now, I'll make sure I get this one right. Do you have trouble? getting your lizard up in the mornings. Do you suffer from erectile dysfunction? Oh, Julian. <laughs> well, I think that now brings this particularly special episode of Lawyers with Attitude to an end. And uh, I encourage all of our viewers to send in their comments either by email or text to us. Or Facebook. Or Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I have a face. You can Twitter me. I'm a member of the Twitterati. I am VLWA. The Lawyer with Attitude. Thank you very much, Julian. And you, Judy. Bye. Bye.